Hi, I'm Ted Bible, pastor of St. Mark's United Methodist Church, and uh, thanks again for joining me uh, this week. And uh, today we're going to be looking at the New Testament book of James. And perhaps the most interesting fact about this New Testament book uh, that we want to study is that, the, that James is the brother of Jesus. And at one time, he did not believe that his older brother Jesus was the Messiah. Thus, James was not a follower of Jesus while Jesus was alive. And we can find evidence of this truth in the, in the book of John, chapter 7, verse 5, where we read that even his own brothers did not believe in him. So we wonder, right? We wonder what changed James from being an unbeliever to a devoted follower of Jesus Christ and ultimately a leader within the Jerusalem church. His transformation undoubtedly occurred as a direct result of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And we find evidence of that in Paul's writing from verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, where we learn that James was one of the first people to whom Jesus appeared after his resurrection. The writing of this letter by James took place about 15 years after the death of Jesus. And at the time, as I said, James was a respected leader within the Jerusalem church. So we're just going to be looking today at, at, at James uh, chapter 1 and studying verses 1 through 8. And verse 1 reads that James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he writes to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, and he says greetings. This letter opens by telling us that it is, that it is addressed to the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered among the nations. This refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. These were Christian Jews who were living outside of the land of Israel. These Jewish believers in Jesus were now living in Gentile nations. These Jews were seldom accepted by the natural born residents of these countries. And in fact, they were often abused and they had less social standing than that of a slave. So they had it really rough. In other words, these Christians had it really tough. They were being challenged. They were being threatened. They were being abused. They were being persecuted. So James writes this letter to encourage these believers to remain committed to Jesus Christ as their Savior and to persevere through their difficulties and through their struggles because the reward of eternal life with God awaits them at the end of their journey. Reading on then, verses 2 through 4. James writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. At first glance, this comment to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials well, that comment can certainly be confusing, can it? Because I don't believe many of us find joy in our trials. But rather, what, we, what, it, what he means is that we need to learn from our trials and from our struggles. And make no mistake, we will certainly have struggles and we will have trials. Notice again that he says, whenever you face trials, not if you face trials, thus trials of all kinds, will occur in our lives. There's no getting around that. So we need to be Christ-centered, and we need, to be com we, need to be, uh, we need to confront, and we need to deal with the reality of our trials and of our struggles. We cannot run away from them. James continues then with verse 5, and, and he writes, he says, uh, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. By wisdom, James is talking not only about head knowledge, but about the ability to make wise decisions in in difficult uh, circumstances. The ability to make these wise decisions will come only when we decide to be God-centered rather than self-centered. God-centered means that we are placing our complete faith and trust in God and in God alone. It means that we have surrendered 
our personal agendas in our lives, and we have signed on to God's agenda. It means that life is no longer just about us, but rather God comes first, followed by others, and then we occupy that third position. When we are no longer self-centered, but have, but have become God-centered, we will discover wisdom. We will be able to discern right choices from wrong choices. To believe and not doubt, as recorded in verse 6, means not only believing in the existence of God, but believing that He really loves and cares for you. To believe and not doubt means that we should expect to hear and answer from God when we call out to Him in prayer. This passage then comes to a conclusion as we read verse 12. And in verse 12 it reads, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. God's crown of life is, is not glory and honor here on this earth, but rather the reward of eternal life, which is, is, is living with God for all time. We all face trials. We all face trials in our life, and they come to us in a variety of ways and at various times. We have relationship trials with family, which can be truly heart-wrenching. We love our brother, we love our sister, we love our parents, our child, our spouse. But you know, sometimes, sometimes we just really don't like them very much. We long for good relationships with them, but no matter how hard we try, there is always some issue that creates strain and stress in our relationship. We can also have trials and struggles with our friends, which calls us to question the value and the nature of our friendship. We may have trials and struggles with our finances, which causes us to wonder if we will ever be able to see our way to comfortable financial living. We have trials with our health, sometimes age-related and sometimes just as just an unfortunate reality of life or of poor choices. Some may struggle with an addiction and the challenge of either kicking the habit or being able to stay away from the temptation and people that seek to suck us back in. This is just some of the trials and the struggles that we as professing Christians face. James reminds us in this writing, he reminds us that we will always face trials, that we will always be tested. There is no escaping it. But he also tells us that if we are not in the, in the word of God on a regular basis, then we will constantly be challenged and unable to rise above our existing trials. Did you get that? He's reminding us to always be in the Word of God. In other words, we will constantly be wallowing around in the muck if we are not aware of the power of God to act and if we don't believe that God will act on our behalf. I'm reminded of scripture that we find recorded in the Old Testament, book of 2 Samuel, and in chapter 5, verses 17 through 25. I want to read these to us. Uh, that, that finds King David in a difficult situation, not once, but twice. And he calls upon God for direction. So 2 Samuel chapter 5, uh, beginning with verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of, of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Pale Berizim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Once more, the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. 
As soon as you hear the sound, get this, as soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. Here's my point in sharing that scripture with you today. Now, some of you may know me who listen, and if you do, you know, uh, you, you will discover that I'm not real good at scripture memorization. I've never been good at memorizing things, and I'm not very good at scripture memorization. In, in, in one-on-one conversations, I can't quote book, chapter, and verse very often. I just can't do it. I wish I could, but I can't. But I know the stories. I know the stories because I read the book, the Bible, every day. And because I attend a couple of Bible studies during the week where I, where I study the Word of God with some other faithful men. I am committed to learning and knowing God's Word. And here is what I have learned. Because I know what the Bible says, I believe what the Bible says. Because I know what the Bible says, I believe what the Bible says. Because I know that God can move before the army of Israel to defeat the Philistines, I believe that God can move before me to defeat my enemies. And because I know that God can move before the army of Israel to defeat the Philistines, I believe that God can move before you and defeat your enemies as well. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe that God can help you persevere through the trials and struggles of your life? Friends, I promise you that he can. The story from 2 Samuel chapter 5 is only one of thousands of examples of how God was moving to defend his people when he was called upon. God does not want to see you drowning in the waters of despair, but rather God wants to save you. But first... You need to believe that he can save you. And second, you need to call out to him. It is all up to you to make that decision. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there are times when we complain about the trials and the tests that seem to litter our walk through life. May we increasingly learn to regard the various trials we face as pure joy and the inevitable difficulties that come my way, and our way as glorious opportunities to rejoice in you. Lord God, we pray that we may face our daily trials joyfully, knowing that the testing of our faith will produce endurance and trust in you. May we increase our independence. May may we grow in our dependence, though, on you during good times and during bad. This, our Lord, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just want to say thank you once again for joining me today and thank you for your prayer support support of our ministries here at St. Mark's and for your financial support. And if you would like to support us financially with a gift, you may do so by mailing it to St. Mark's United Methodist Church, 1110 North Metcalf Street, Lima, Ohio, 45801. Or you may go online to our website at limastmarks.com, limastmarks.com. Click on the link that says Give in the upper right-hand corner, and that will take you to our, our giving page uh, where you can make a, make, a, make a financial gift. There's a variety of options there for you to choose from. So I pray God's blessing be upon you, and until next time, go in peace.